Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. I am Matthew Silverman, the director of the Haberman Institute for Jewish Studies, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to our lecture titled, At Home in an Anti-Semitic City, The Jews of Vienna Before the Holocaust, with Dr. Marsha Rosenblatt. This program continues our 40th anniversary celebration in memory of Rabbi Joshua O. Haberman, who founded the Institute in, 19, in 1983. Rabbi Haberman was born in Vienna, Austria, and graduated from the University of Vienna. In 1938, the year of the Nazi annexation of Austria, he was a student at Vienna's rabbinical seminary. An imitation by Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati enabled him to come to the United States. I look forward to discovering more about the Jewish life in Vienna prior to the Holocaust, a time that greatly shaped Rabbi Haberman's life. Thank you to the Schick family who sponsored this lecture in loving memory of Renee and Frank Schick. As usual, if you have any questions, please click on the Q&A button on your Zoom screen. Questions will be discussed at the end of the lecture. And I now welcome Art Hessel, the Haberman Institute Board Vice President, who will introduce our speaker. Welcome, Art. Thank you, Matt. Um... And good, good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's program. We're pleased that you've taken the time to join us in this very difficult period of time for, for Israel, for the world, and for each of us. As many of you know, the Haberman Institute was started as the Foundation for Jewish Studies in 1983 by Rabbi Haberman as he was retiring from Washington Hebrew Congregation. Rabbi Haberman led the foundation for almost 35 years before he passed away in, nine, in uh, 2017 at the age of 97, and the foundation was renamed in his honor shortly after his passing, and as Matt said, this year we are celebrating its 40th anniversary and providing high-quality, in-depth encounters with Jewish thought, culture, and history. This year, specifically, we're honoring Rabbi Haberman with a series of programs devoted to his life. Last month, we had a special evening with Rabbi David Ellenson, the former chancellor of Hebrew Union College, which was Rabbi Haberman's alma mater here. Rabbi Ellenson gave two lectures on Rabbi Leo Beck and truth-telling during the Holocaust. And you can view Rabbi Ellenson's talks anytime you want on our website along with about 200 other programs which the Institute has presented over the years. Tonight, we're going to be learning about the Jews of Vienna, and as Matt said, that's where Rabbi Haberman was born and where he was a rabbinical student at the time of the Anschluss when he was lucky enough to be able to come to the United States and complete his rabbinical studies in Cincinnati. And yes, later this year, we will have a program on the Jewish history of Cincinnati. Our next program will be presented uh, one week from tonight. It, it is titled, Turning Germans Against Jews, Photographic Denunciation in Pre-War Nazi Germany. It'll be a study of media disinformation and how it was used and will be presented by Dr. Julie Koretsis, a postdoctoral fellow at American University. It'll be a hybrid program. You can watch it on Zoom, or if you're in the D.C. area, you can attend the program in person at Har Shalom Synagogue in Potomac, Maryland. We invite you to check our schedule for future programming at HabermanInstitute.org or through the weekly email alerts, which I'm sure most of you do receive. And when you go to our website, you'll see that we're a 501c3 organization and that we make it easy for you to donate to us to enable us to continue to bring this high quality programming to you. And anything you give us, we really appreciate. Back to this evening. Often when a speaker is introduced, the introducer starts by looking at a CV which shows a job history much too long and complicated to be included in a brief introduction. With Professor Marsha Rosenblatt, there is no such problem. 
Professor Rosenblatt joined the faculty of the University of Maryland in 1978, and she's never left. She has taught at Maryland for 45 years. And for those of you who are mathematically inclined, that's five years longer than 40 years ago when the Haberman Institute was formed. Dr. Rosenblatt is the author of two books, one of which is called The Jews of Vienna, 1867 to 1914, colon, Assimilation and Identity, and the other, The Jews of Habsburg, Austria during World War I, which obviously continues the story. She's edited several other books. She's written dozens of articles on Central European Jewish history. Dr. Rosenblatt is a New York City native. She earned her PhD from Columbia. And most importantly, she's a member of the Haberman Institute's Academic Advisory Board and is involved in numerous other professional and civic organizations. So that's Dr. Marcia Rosenblatt. And with that, I turn the imaginary podium over to my good friend, Dr. Marcia Rosenblatt. Thank you so much, Art. That was a really lovely um, uh, introduction. I, I want to begin before I even start to talk to say how honored I am to be giving this lecture. When I first came to Washington in 1978, um, Josh Haberman was the rabbi at Washington Hebrew. He heard that I worked on Vienna. I had done a dissertation on the Jews of Vienna, and he invited me to give a talk at Washington Hebrew. And we we bonded over Vienna, so to speak, and I, I remained quite um, friendly with him and his wonderful wife, Maxine, for um, all the years that they lived in Washington. Um, and um, and I, I'm really honored to have known him, and I'm honored to be giving this lecture in his memory, really. Um, he'd probably correct me about certain things, though, when I talked, and, that, and I, I kind of miss the fact that he can't do it. Anyway, uh, so let me start talking. Uh, I entitled my lecture At Home in an Anti-Semitic City, uh, The Jews of Vienna Before the Holocaust. And that first part of the title is really important. Um, it really sums up what I want to say. Uh, it really encapsulates what I want to say tonight. Jews were indeed at home in Vienna, and Vienna was indeed an anti-Semitic city. Um, and Jews fled from it. Um, in the aftermath of the Anschluss, much as Joshua Haberman did, much as Rabbi Haberman did. Um, it, they fled from Vienna in March of 1938. About two-thirds of Viennese Jews were lucky enough to flee, although only half of Viennese Jews altogether, not half of two-thirds, but half of all Jews in Vienna. So whatever the math is, um, only managed to get to safety. I, other Jews got stuck in places like France and Holland and Belgium. But, um, but many, so half of Viennese Jews did manage to get to safety in the United States, in Great Britain, in the British Mandate for Palestine, today Israel, in Shanghai, in South America, I mean, all over the place. Um, and yet, nevertheless, despite the anti-Semitism of the city, and despite the fact that they had to flee in 1938, and not all of them successfully, unfortunately, um, Vienna remained alluring to them. I have read a lot of Viennese Jewish memoirs over the course of my scholarly career. Um, and in fact, now I'm working on a book on Jewish refugees from the Habsburg, from the former Habsburg monarchy who fled uh, between 1938 and 41. So I've read even more. But um, these Jews all talk about how important Vienna remained for them. As one memorist, a man named uh, Benno Weiser Varone, noted in his 1992 memoir, and I quote, whatever my later feelings about Austria, I shall always remain a Viennese. And this was said by someone who was a Zionist and later a diplomat for the state of Israel. He was always a Viennese. And he, by the way, never felt comfortable in Israel. He uh, lived many places and Israel only for four years, despite the fact that he was an ambassador. So what was the allure of Vienna? Why did Viennese Jews feel so Viennese, even when they were very honest um, about Viennese and all Austrian anti-Semitism? 
What was the magic of Vienna? Or was it magic? Was it something else? Minna Lox, um, who was a refugee from Galicia during World War I to Vienna, she was only seven years old at the time, she came with her parents. Um, anyway, she noted in her memoirs written in 1986 that Vienna was, and I quote, the most beautiful city in the world, unquote. I'm not quite sure that's true, by the way, but she thought it was. Um, and it was also, she noted, and I quote, the door to the European intellectual world. She probably didn't think that at seven, but she did think it later. Similarly, another Galician Jewish refugee during World War I, a man named Manus Sperber, who was also a child when he came to Vienna in 1916, he noted in his memoirs, excuse me, and I quote, I was absolutely certain when he, they came to Vienna, I was absolutely certain that we now finally reached the place with the gigantic gateway through which I could step into the wide world dedicated to the future. Everything lay before us, unquote. Of course, both Minna Lox and Manus Sperber suffered from bedbugs and poverty as refugees in Vienna during World War I, but both came to love love the city, which they both fled. Perhaps, ex perhaps this magic of Vienna was best expressed by Weiser Varon, whom I've quoted already, who was also a child when he came during World War II. There were a lot of refugees. They fled the Russian army in Galicia and Bukovina. In his case, he was a baby when he came from Bukovina to Vienna. And he writes in his memoirs, quote, yes, a Jew certainly could feel at home in Vienna. In fact, that's where I got the title from, at home in Vienna. Um, why? Why was Vienna so alluring for him? Um, well, for him, he tells us in his memoirs, they're very long and very interesting. Anyway, he lived, he, there were two reasons that he found Vienna alluring. First of all, he lived in the main Jewish neighborhood of Vienna, the Leopoldstadt the second district. Later, I'll show you a map, show you where that is. But he lived in this main Jewish neighborhood. And as he noted, growing up in its shelter, I was unaware of belonging to a minority, unquote. He was unaware of belonging to a minority because the Leopoldstadt was very, very Jewish. It wasn't as Jewish as he remembered it. Um, he, In fact, it was only 35% Jewish in a city which was about eight to 9% Jewish. Um, but but a section of the Leopoldstadt what was where most Jews lived, and that was more than 35% Jewish. Um, and what that meant was that his class in gymnasium in high school, uh, which had 32 boys, that is his grade, had, uh, had 32 boys, it, and that included 10 non-Jews, he tells us. That means that two-thirds of his high school classmates were Jewish. Um, that's extraordinary. That's like New York in the 1950s in certain neighborhoods, right? That's not like Europe any place. Well, it is like Poland, but it isn't like uh, uh, any place in Central or Western Europe. So that's one reason. He lived in the Leopoldstadt, which was very Jewish. And the second reason is that in Vienna, he said, this is him, not me, uh, Jews didn't think of themselves as outsiders since they were so prominent in many areas, in literature. Um, I, you know, many of the great German writers from Vienna were, were Jews, Arthur Schnitzler, Stefan Zweig, and many others. In music, Gustav Mahler, um, and many others. Um, in uh, psychoanalysis, right, Freud. Um, in medicine, in law, in journalism, and in, and one could go on and on, he says, and one could say. So that's what Weiser Varon tells us. But perhaps, and now we get to me, um, perhaps, and this is my main point, Jews felt at home in Vienna and they loved it because it was the place in which they became Europeans, in which they became part of the European world, in which they became modern, in which they became integrated into the larger society. It happened in other places too, obviously, in Berlin and in Budapest and so forth. But for the Jews who lived in Vienna, it happened in Vienna. 
um, it was the place which it uh, which in which they became modern Jews, and it was a big city, a great metropolis, which allowed them to modernize and integrate and assimilate as much as they wanted or as little as they wanted. Um, uh, so for them, Vienna therefore was very important, and it, it it allowed them to do so very well. But of course, Vienna was anti-Semitic, right? We can't forget that ever. Whenever we talk about Vienna. Uh, that was always there in the background. Jews did have equal rights, right? Austria, uh, Austria, Hungary, the Austrian Empire emancipated the Jews in 1867. Jews had full legal equality all over Austria, Hungary. Um, and that Jewish legal status was not challenged until the Nazis. But anti Semitism, um, the politics of resentment, uh, flourished in Vienna in the late 19th and throughout the pre-Holocaust 20th century. Um, it was in Vienna, the anti-Semites were led by a party, a, an anti-Semitic political party called the Christian Social Party, led by a man named Karl Weger. Um, and that party, the Christian Social Party, won the majority of seats on the Vienna City Council in 1895. And Weger, the leader of that party, was mayor from 1897 until his death in 1910. He didn't serve as mayor between 1895 and 1897 because the Austrian emperor refused to confirm him uh, because he was a vicious anti-Semite. And ultimately, the emperor had to confirm him as mayor because Austria was a constitutional state and he kept on winning election, the, the election. So he was confirmed. But his party retained power um, until 1919 when um, the Christian socials stopped uh, winning the majority in the Vienna City Council because of universal suffrage. Um, I'm not referring to the fact that women voted, although they did, but because before um, uh, World War I, before 1919, only people who paid a certain amount of taxes could vote. And that meant that a lot of people didn't vote. Um, once everybody could vote, they voted for the socialists and Vienna became known as Red Vienna. That didn't stop it from having a lot of anti-Semitism, but it did mean that the city government wasn't um, uh, anti-Semitic any longer. But that changed in 1934 when the Austro-Fascists took over. And then of course, in 1938, when the Nazis came to power in Austria. The Christian Social Party as a party fed on resentments of the lower middle class, um, that is people who were shopkeepers and um, sort of independent artisans and lower level civil servants and teachers, people like that, you know, policemen and firemen, th those kinds of people. Um, uh, their resentments of capitalism and liberalism and modern economic and political forces um, and and it was a very successful party. It was the most successful anti-Semitic party in Europe uh, before the Nazis. Um, and uh, it was very popular in Vienna. And it was also very popular in the territory of what became Austria after the war. But as I like to tell my students, city governments collect the garbage. They don't make the law. Uh, so nothing happened to the Jews because the Christian socials were in power. Nothing happened at all because they were in power in the city, um, except perhaps Jews were treated rudely when they went to city hall to get paperwork taken care of. Um, but it did remind the Jews that they didn't fully belong. It was There was always that reminder. And this anti-Semitism, this Christian social anti-Semitism was excited. The Christian socials and people who voted for them were very much excited by the rise of Nazism in Germany, first in 1933 and then in Austria. The, the, there were a lot of Austrian Nazis. Um, uh, Hitler was an Austrian Nazi, for example. I mean, he had moved to Germany, but he was an Austrian, um, not from Vienna. He was from um, Upper Austria. But... Um, uh, but the anti-Semites were excited by the rise of, na of Nazism, and there was an outpouring of pro-Nazi feeling in Vienna in 1938. A million people came to greet Hitler in Heldenplatz, a big square in the center of Vienna, uh, when Hitler came to Vienna in March of 1938. Um, a million people in a city of two million, that is a lot of people <laughs> who were excited by Nazism. There were people who hated Nazism, but there were a lot of people excited by Nazism. 
And there was also in Vienna, unlike in most of Germany, there was an enormous amount of anti-Jewish violence in Vienna after the Nazi uh, takeover in 1938. Um, there was what was called wild violence. It was not directed by the government, but a lot of people um, attacked Jews in the street. They didn't kill them. It wasn't that bad, but it was, um, you know, beating Jews up, making them do humiliating things, making them paint signs, uh, making them scrub the streets. I mean, you know, it was a really terrible situation. Okay, so now I've sketched out. Jews loved Vienna, and there was a lot of anti-Semitism. I've just explained my title. But my job tonight is to show how this tension played out in reality or in the history of the Jews in Vienna between uh, the middle of the 19th century through the through the Holocaust. So now I'm gonna share my screen. Let's see, and hopefully that will work nicely. Yes, it will. And um, okay, oops, it went, it didn't go to the beginning, there it is. Okay, so here we have uh, the, just the title page, but there we have a map of Europe. Um, before World War I, there was this big country called Austria-Hungary, this red country in the middle of Europe, and that's a more schematic picture of it. This is the city of Vienna here in the province of Lower Austria. Um, and this was a big country, very diverse, linguistically, religiously, nationally, ethnically, millions of ways diverse. I'm not going to explain that now for uh, in the interest of time. This area here, these provinces, Lower Austria, Upper Austria, Styria, etc., that's present day Austria. Um, this area here, Bohemia and Moravia is the Czech Republic today. This area, Galicia, had been part of southern Poland. It came into Austria during the interwar period. It was in Poland. And today, the western part is in Poland and the eastern part is, guess what, in Ukraine. Um, this is the Kingdom of Hungary. God knows. This is the top part of it is Slovakia. And there's Hungary. This is Transylvania. I mean, I can't go into too much detail now. But um, very complex place. So that's Austria-Hungary. But what I'd like to talk about first is the migration of Jews to Vienna. Um, before 1848, Jews were not allowed to live in Vienna. J Vienna was one of the cities of Europe, there were many, that had the right of not tolerating Jews. And that is the city itself had the right to not tolerate Jews. So there were no Jews in Vienna. Uh, they were not allowed to live in Vienna. Of course, it's a truism of Jewish history when that when there are no Jews, there are Jews. So in fact, when there were no Jews in the city, there were a few thousand Jews in the city. Um, and that's because the city of Vienna by the mm, late 18th and um, uh, by the by from the middle of the 18th century through the middle of the 19th century, did allow very, very, very wealthy Jews to purchase the right of toleration for a lot of money. Um, and uh, they could come and live in Vienna with their families, with their servants, with their employees, um, and with their hangers on. That wasn't officially allowed, but that's what happened. And so in 1848, when there were no Jews in Vienna, in fact, there were probably 4,000 Jews in Vienna. Um, in 1829, we know the exact number of tolerated Jews. There were 135 tolerated Jews. And so we think there were about a thousand Jews in Vienna in 1829, but somehow between 1829 and 1848, the number grew significantly. So um, uh, in 1848, there was a revolution and it was unsuccessful, it was defeated, never mind. Um, but the Jews in the Austrian Empire were given freedom of movement. They were, um, and, and cities which had the right of not tolerating Jews were deprived of that right. So Jews were allowed to move to Vienna and so they did. Um, and there were three waves of Jewish migration to Vienna, all from Austria-Hungary. These are not Russian Jews fleeing the Tsar at all. Um, there were virtually no Russian Jews there, but um, they came from other parts of Austria-Hungary. They came first, the first wave was from the provinces of Bohemia and Moravia, today's Czech Republic. Um, that was, it's in the 1850s and 60s, Jews came to Vienna from those provinces, which were very close here, right, from Moravia to Vienna, you know, I mean, and the railroad existed already. It was an easy migration. Um, uh, the, uh, the Jews who came from Bohemia and Moravia were already Germanized, that is, they spoke German. All Jews in Europe had spoken Yiddish, but the Jews in Bohemia and Moravia, for complicated reasons, already knew German. Um, they lived in a 
provinces. They lived in two provinces that were two thirds Czech speaking and one third German speaking. But Joseph II, the Austrian emperor in the 1780s, had required that they build German Jewish schools, and they did. And so by the middle of the 19th century, they spoke German. Some of them were traditionally religious. Others of them had already abandoned some of traditional, some or a lot of traditional Judaism. So that was the first wave. The second wave of migration came from Hungary, um, but mostly from Western, the Western parts of Hungary. Um, from what we now would call Western Slovakia, and, and this is Western Hungary. Uh, they came from here, uh, from this region. Uh, this is Slovakia today, um, but they came from this region of it. Um, so they were very close. Um, as a matter of fact, the largest city in Western Slovakia is here on the Danube. It's Pres Well, it was called Pressburg in German. Today, the Slovaks call it um, Bratislava. Um, but it's you know, like 40 kilometers from Vienna. <laughs> it's really close. Um, so uh, they came from there. And um, some of them had already Germanized uh, for the same reason, because of these German Jewish schools. Others had not. Um, many were deeply religious because this area here um, was the bastion of non-Hasidic ultra-Orthodoxy. Non-Hasidic ultra-Orthodoxy. Um, so many of them were deeply religious, others were not, you know, so, some modernization had taken place before the migration to Vienna is my point. Um, I should point out that Hungary, which had a large Jewish population, the Hasidim, most of whom lived in Eastern Hungary, they lived in Northeastern Hungary and, and Southeastern Hungary in this whole region, um, they didn't go to Vienna or Budapest, they stayed where they were um, uh, to be killed by the Nazis in World War II. Okay. Um, and then that's the second wave of migration, and it starts in the 1850s and 60s, but it really picks up in the 1870s and 80s and 90s. And then the final third wave comes from Galicia, which is this area that had traditionally been part of Poland um, and, um, and had been in Austria since the end of the 18th century. Most of them were Yiddish speaking. Some knew Polish, some knew German, but most of them were Yiddish speaker, speakers. Some were deeply religious, some of them were Hasidim, some were not, um, but they were a more traditional group of Jews. Um, and so there were these three waves of migration. Um, that wave of migration only began in the 1890s. It's, it's later, you know, it's in the 1890s, the 1900s. And then there was another big surge during World War I because a lot of the Russian army invaded Galicia at the beginning uh, in August of 1914, and then again in the summer of 1916, and um, a lot of Jews fled. 400,000 Jews out of 900,000 Jews fled, not all to Vienna, they went to various places, but a lot of them came to Vienna and some of them went back, some of them went on to America after the war, but many of them stayed. Okay, so the numbers, the numbers of the Jew, of Jews in Vienna grew enormously. As I said, there were 4,000 in, in 1848, there were 40,000 in 1869. Wow, that's a huge increase. There were 73,000 in 1880, 118,000 in, um, I'm sorry, in 1890, 147,000 in 1900, 175,000 in 1910, and about 200,000 in the 1920s and 30s. Um, Jews were about 8%, 8 to 9, depending on the year, uh, percent of the population of about 2 million. Okay. Budapest, by the way, was about the same size, a little bit bigger, closer to 200,000. Um, in the 19th century, late 19th century. Um, Budapest also didn't have Jews in it until the 1840s. But um, the uh, Budapest was about the same size, but much more densely Jewish. Budapest was 25% Jewish. And the anti-Semites called Budapest, Budapest, because it was so Jewish. Okay, so Jews migrated to Vienna. They also experienced economic transformation. Um, they, um, uh, all the economic restrictions that Jews had traditionally labored under in Central Europe fell by the wayside at various points in the 1780s and 1848 and the 1850s and 60s. Um, and in Vienna, the Jews who came to Vienna came to pursue new economic uh, positions. New, they, they pursued new careers uh, in various fields. Uh, traditionally, in, in the Austrian Empire, apart from Galicia, Jews had been relegated to petty trade. 
But in Vienna, after 18, you know, after the 1780s and 1850s and so forth, they um, expanded into all areas of commerce in and but and remained concentrated there. Uh, some Jews became industrialists, that is, they had factories that produced goods of one kind or another. Some became professionals, doctors, lawyers, journalists, engineers. Uh, and many became what I like to label commercial employees, that is, clerks, salesmen, managers in business enterprises. Almost none of them were laborers of any kind, you know, workers in factories or in artisanal workshops. And almost none, very few of them were in the civil service. And remember, Vienna is like Washington. It's a government town. Um, everybody works for the government in, 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 in Vienna, not everybody, but a lot of people. And that was not true for the Jews because that was one area that did um, have de facto discrimination, um, especially in the more prestigious parts of the civil service, foreign service and so forth. So in 1910, just to give you some statistics, I know people don't like to hear statistics, but I, I promise this is the last of the statistics. 4% um, of all Jews were who worked in the workforce were civil servants of one sort or another. 11% were professionals, 3% were industrials, 33% were merchants. That is, they had shops and, you know, it, it, were involved in buying and selling stuff. 35% um, were business employees, clerks, salesmen, managers, and only 5% were workers in factories or workshops. Um, and that's really in contrast to non-Jews, who are about 50% of the Viennese workshops, uh, workers, uh, workforce rather, were workers in factories or workshops, and a very large percentage worked for the civil, you know, were, were bureaucrats of one kind or another. All of this, this economic transformation reflects economic modernization. It also reflects declining religious observance because business employees had to work on Saturday because it was a regular day of work. And all of this means that the Jews were different economically than other Viennese. Um, so the more Jews change, the more they remain different is a good motto to describe this. I should point out too that a lot of Jews were poor. I mean, some of the merchants were peddlers, not all of them, some of them were wealthy merchants, but some of them were peddlers. And some of the clerks and salesmen were also pretty, you know, poor. And we know that a lot of Jews were poor in Vienna, despite the image of Vienna as this great cultural mecca. We know that a lot of Jews were poor because um, two thirds of the Jews in Vienna could not afford to pay the minimum tax to the Jewish community, uh, which they all were required to pay. Okay, so we have migration, we have economic modernization, and we have residential concentration. Okay, that's just, oh, that's a map of Europe in 1922 after the war, just so you could see the different, you know, we have Austria, Czechoslovakia, and so forth. Okay, so, oh, I also have pictures of Vienna, uh, but it, that's necessary for the residential concentration. So this is the city of Vienna. Here's, the Danube is actually out here. Um, this is called the Danube Canal. Um, and um, the this area here is the inner city. If, if you've been in Vienna, you know all this. Um, and there's a semicircular boulevard around the inner city called the Ring, which was built where the walls of the city of Vienna were. The city of Vienna before 1860 was just here. They incorporated these outer suburbs and then these outer suburbs and so forth. But the um, Jews concentrated residentially. They, they they really concentrated in some areas. They essentially lived in the Leopoldstadt, which is the second district of Vienna, which is this area here across the Danube Canal from the inner city. It's, a, it's essentially an island in the Danube. Um, the Danube is a complicated river, like all rivers. Um, and um, the Jews lived there. 35% of all Jews in Vienna lived in the Leopoldstadt. And I have a map that shows you that, but it's not so clear. Uh, this is the Leopoldstadt, um, and that's where a lot of Jews lived. Um, they also lived in the Alzergrund, which uh, here's a, another map, but um, that which is the ninth district, which is here, um, and uh, and that's where Freud lived and Herzl lived. It was a more it was a middle class area. Uh, Leopoldstadt had middle class areas and and poor areas. 
Um, about 12%, so 35% of all Jews lived in Leopoldstadt, about 12% of the Jews lived in Alsergrund, and then 8% lived in the inner city. Um, so what this means is, I mean, Jews were not, there was no ghetto, there was no um, discrimination in housing, actually, despite the anti-Semitic city, there was no housing discrimination. Nevertheless, Jews chose to live near other Jews um, and not in the outer, you know, in other parts of the city, which were less Jewish. And these maps, unfortunately, I, I did these, they're in my book on the Jews of Vienna, but this, you know, it's a scan from a Xerox, rather, so it does, didn't come out so well. But this is the Alzergrund, and this is the inner city, and that's where most of the Jews, uh, in fact, lived. So what this means, what this residential concentration means, is that there were places in the city that seemed Jewish, that were coded, so to speak, Jewish, to Jews and to non-Jews. Um, and, and in fact, in the interwar period, in the 1920s and 30s, the Leopoldstadt, the second district of Vienna, this area here, was called in German, die Matzes Insel, the island of Matze, uh, because that's where the Jews were. Um, the Jews were concentrated there. And 35% doesn't sound like a lot, but the Jews were in a part of the Leopoldstadt. They weren't in the whole of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's that's the, oh, that's the synagogue. I'll go back to the map of Vienna just so you can look. That's maybe a slightly clearer map from 1912. Um, the Jews who came to Vienna, not only economically modernized and concentrated residentially, they also became Austro-Germans. That is, they adopted the German language if they didn't already know it. Um, and um, those who did come from Yiddish speaking places like Alicia um, tried not to speak Yiddish, even though they knew it, um, or had Yiddish inflict and in, in um, you know influence their German. Um, a lot of memoirs talk about that. You know, they knew Yiddish, they understood their grandparents, but they didn't want to speak Yiddish because they it, they didn't want it to influence their German. They wanted to speak good German. Um, they also, though, on the other hand, avoided speaking the Viennese dialect. Jews didn't speak Viennese dialect. They spoke High German, not Viennese dialect. Um, although some probably understood it and spoke it, but mostly they didn't. So Jews learned German. They loved the Kaiser, the uh, Franz Josef, who was the emperor of Austria from 1848 until his death in 1916. Uh, they loved him very much, not just in Vienna, every place in Austria, Hungary. And they were very patriotic to the this big Habsburg Austria, um, especially in World War One. And they during World War One, they very much wanted for this monarchy, this multinational monarchy, to continue. And although they knew it would probably collapse, and they wanted it to continue, and they were very upset in November 1918 when the monarchy, in fact, collapsed. They saw it as equitable, just, and they saw it as something that protected them from anti-Semitism. And they very much worried, and correctly so, they very much worried about um, the anti-Semitism in the successor states, in these states that came into existence, in Poland, in, 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 in Czechoslovakia, where it wasn't as bad as in some of the other places, in Hungary, where it was very bad, in Romania, where it was even worse. And in Austria itself, um, uh, they 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 were very upset uh, by this collapse of the monarchy, and they feared anti-Semitism. Um, so they identified as Austro-German, but most of the Jews of Vienna remained very Jewish. Not necessarily religious; some were religious, some were not. But um, but they remained very Jewish in their basic. Um, you know, manner of life. Yes, of course, not all of them. Yes, there were converts to Christianity. Um, Vienna had a lot of conversion to Christianity by those who sought total assimilation, or at the very least wanted to marry non-Jews, because while there was civil marriage in Austria, there was no civil intermarriage. That is, um, people of different religions couldn't marry each other. And so in order to do that, they, one of them had to convert either to the religion of the other or to a neutral category without religion. Um, and, um, and some people did. They can, some people converted to um, Catholicism or Protestantism and some even to this neutral category. Oh, and yes, there were socialists, Jewish socialists who 
uh, didn't convert to Christianity, but who uh, certainly um, wanted to not be at all Jewish, um, and they rejected Jewish identity, and many of them also converted to this ca neutral category without religion. But most Jews remained Jewish. There were many reasons and many ways that they did that. The structures of urban life um, sustained Jewish difference. Um, Jews occupied an economic niche. They lived in Jewish neighborhoods, um, right? There was that operated to sustain Jewish distinctiveness. But Jewish religion remained an important force and a vital force in Jewish life, even if most Jews abandoned some or much or all of Jewish religious tradition. Sigmund Freud observed no Jewish rituals whatsoever, but he considered himself a Jew. He was very proud to be a Jew. He was a, a, you know, a, a self-affirming Jew. He always paid his taxes to the Jewish religious community because he had to, um, and, and so on. So Jewish religion remained a vital force, even if some Jews abandoned Jewish re uh, religious ritual and many Jews abandoned a little bit. All Jews had to belong to the, to the Jewish religious community. It was called the Israelitische Kultusgemeinde, the Jewish religious community. All Jews had to belong to it and to pay taxes to it. Uh, to uh, sustain its activities. Um, this was common. I mean, Catholics had to belong to a you know, Catholic community and Protestants as well. This wasn't just only for the Jews. And this was true all over Europe. Um, not being required to belong to a religious community is distinctively American and British too, but not um, uh, it, every place in Europe Jews had to belong, except France, which uh, had separation of church and state in 1906, but every other place required Jews to belong to the Jewish community. Um, so all Jews had to belong and they had to label themselves Jewish on all official documents. Um, I mean, Catholics had to do the same, Protestants had to do the same, everybody had to do it, but uh, so to the Jews. Um, and so there were many synagogues, synagogues proliferated. The Israel, Israel Bittisha Kultusgemeinde had official synagogues. Um, that is the interior of the main synagogue in Vienna, the Zeitenstettengasse Temple. Um, it's the oldest synagogue in Vienna as well. It was built in 1826, uh, before the Jews were allowed to have a Jewish community in Vienna. They were not allowed to have a Jewish community, and they had to build the synagogue in a way that made it not look like a synagogue from the street. Uh, from the street, it looks like an apartment house. Um, and it's attached to the apartment houses on either side, but inside it looks like a synagogue. Um, and uh, that is the synagogue um, on Zeitenstetten Gasse. Um, um, and um, I'll get back to that in a second. That's another synagogue that the, the Jewish community built. That was the Leopoldstadt Synagogue, um, which was built, or, or the Leopoldstadter Temple, which was built in 1858. Um, it's Moorish, which was very common for synagogues in the middle of the 19th century. It was destroyed on Kristallnacht, of course. The Zeitenstettengasse temple was trashed very badly, but it wasn't destroyed because it was attached to the apartment houses on either side. Um, and of course, the Gemeinde, the Jewish community, had many other synagogues. These synagogues, by the way, were all traditional. There had been an attempt at reform in Vienna, at you know, creating a reform movement in Vienna. In the 18, um, well, in the late 1860s, early 1870s, it failed. Um, and the um, Jewish synagogue, the synagogues of Vienna run by the Jewish community were officially traditional. Men and women sat separately. These, This is the galleries for women and the men sat in the, you know, on the floor of the synagogue. Um, it's, uh, the liturgy was completely traditional. There was no organ, no synagogal music. There was an all male choir. Um, but the, the, the synagogue was modern. It, it had order and decorum. It had a German sermon. It had, um, at the, uh, the, the, the worship was conducted from the front rather than from the middle. So it was a modern synagogue, but it was still traditional. Um, and that, I, I'm not going to do that for, in the interest of time. This is my translation of some of the synagogue rules from 1829, which talked about order and decorum and the sermon and, and so forth. Um, that is uh, Adolf Jelinek. He was one of the rabbis of Vienna in the middle of the 19th century. 
um, and, and chief rabbi at the end of his career there. He was in Vienna from 1858 to 1893. Um, he was a reform rabbi, but he couldn't do reform stuff in Vienna. Uh, that's Moritz Gudemann, who was um, the rabbi. He came in 1866, and he um, was rabbi till his death in 1918. He was the chief rabbi for much from 1893, from Yelenek's death until 1918. Um, he was a graduate of the Breslau Seminary in Germany. He was, um, a, a, you know, like a conservative rabbi in America. Um, that is, he was traditional and modern at the same time. Um, that's another rabbi in Vienna. That he, you know, these are obviously not Hasidic rabbis, right? These are not, uh, he's from Galicia, Joseph Samuel Bloch. Um, and that was the last chief, not the last, the next to last chief rabbi of Vienna. He came um, in after after Gudemann's death in 1820, in 1918, and he, he was chief rabbi until his death in, um, in 1929. Um, uh, and he, uh, you know, you can tell by looking at him, he's a modern, uh, he's a modern Jew. He was also a Zionist. He was the first Zionist rabbi uh, in Vienna. But in addition to, to, you know, the Jewish community synagogues, there was also the, a Hungarian Orthodox synagogue. I don't have a picture of it called the Shifshul, um, in which it was sort of non-Hasidic ultra-Orthodoxy. Um, there was a Polish temple, which used Polish melodies. Uh, there were Hasidic Stiblach. I mean, there was all sorts of synagogues. So there was, you know, a lot of Jewish religious life. Um, Jewish organizations also flourished, um, um, including organizations to fight anti-Semitism, like uh, an organization called the uh, Austrian Israelite Union, which was founded by Joseph Bloch, who might, this man, uh, Joseph Samuel Bloch. Uh, who was also a rabbi. There were philanthropic organizations. And, oh, that's a picture of Lueger, the anti-Semitic ma mayor of Vienna, but I'll not look at him for a minute. Uh, Jewish organizations, philanthropic organizations, social, cultural, political. Jewish newspapers flourished. Zionism flourished, uh, you know, with its own set of organizations and, um, and so forth. Um, in fact, Zionism became ever more prevalent with the passage of time, so that by 1932, the majority of seats on the, the Jewish Communities Board, because there were elections for the Jewish Communities Board, uh, were Zionists. And of course, remember, Theodor Herzl lived in Vienna. That's a picture of the anti-Semitic mayor, but there's Theodor Herzl. He was from Budapest, but he was in Vienna. He was a journalist. He was the features editor of the leading German language newspaper, of Vienna and indeed all of Europe, the Neue Freie Presse, and he became a Zionist in response to the anti-Semitism of Europe and of Vienna and France and other places. And the next picture is the leader of Zionists in the interwar period in the 1920s and 30s. So most Jews in Vienna, he was killed in Auschwitz, by the way, just in case you wanted to know. So most Jews remained very conscious of their Jewishness. Um, and uh, even if they wanted to forget, the anti-Semites would remind them. Um, as Varone noted at the beginning of his memoirs, he didn't need the brown shirts, the Nazis, to remind him he was a Jew. Of course, in March of 1938, he tells us in his memoirs, he wept for Austria, his fatherland lost, and then he knew he had to leave. Uh, and he lived in many places. He lived in Ecuador and then New York and then Jerusalem and then Boston. He lived in many places, but I don't think he was home any place but Vienna. So how can I conclude? Well, I wanna show you more pictures before I go to my conclusion because I prepared the slides before I wrote the lecture. So there's a picture of, uh, the next group of pictures are cultural luminaries, Jewish luminaries. There's Sigmund Freud, Stefan Zweig was a writer, Arthur Schnitzler, a writer. Anita Mueller-Cohen is not a familiar name to people. She was a social worker who did a lot of work for the Jewish refugees in, uh, uh, from Galicia in Vienna during World War I. And then she was a Zionist activist and then moved to Palestine in 1936, where she established Tipat Chalav, which does mother care, still to this day, does mother care in Israel. So people actually know who she is in Israel. And that's a picture of the Kantnerstrasse in leading Shopping Street in Vienna in the 1920s. And I just wanted to show you one picture of, of red Vienna, of socialist Vienna. This is Karl Marxhof, a, a working class housing project built in the 1930s, still hailed as the best public housing project in the world. So how can I conclude? Um, 
how can I conclude? Were the Jews, I'm going to stop my share. Were the Jews at home in Vienna? Yes, even with its anti-Semitism. That is, they were home until the Nazis, uh, who were radical anti-Semites, and made it clear to the Jews that they had to leave. But before the Nazis, they did feel at home. They were Austro-German Jews, and they felt comfortable with all the different parts of their identity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rosenblatt, for such an, an engaging and, and nuanced presentation. I, I appreciated hearing and, and seeing all of the all, all the information about Vienna in the early 20th century. For those of you with questions, um, please go ahead and, and continue to send them in now. Um, I see a few have already started coming in, so we can begin that portion of our evening. Um, to get us started, there's there, there's a, a longer question here, but I'll um, I'll just read it out loud. Uh, I was amazed by the history of the Vietnamese, Vietnamese branch of the wealthy Efrusi banking family in Vienna who considered themselves Viennese and never imagined how virulently, sorry, they were hated until the Anschluss turned their world upside down. They thought they were sure that their money and connections would protect them. They were very, very wrong. And I wonder if you think there's a lesson for Jews uh, in America today. <laughs> Start off with a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Yes, the Afrusis were a very wealthy banking family, and they lived on the ring and the gorgeous mansion. And the some grandson, great grandson, I forget the you know wrote wrote a book about his family, and he talks about them and so forth. Um, uh, they underestimated the Nazis. Yes, they did. Um, people come in all flavors, right? And the Afrusis un underestimated the Nazis. Benno Weiser Verone did not underestimate the, the Nazis, right? He left. Um, and um, the and and so too did a lot of other Jews. I mean, he was a Zionist, and the Zionists you, you might think would have more insight into leaving, um, but non-Zionists left as well. Um, I think it was really hard to understand the Nazis. Nobody knew that what the Nazis were really going to do. Nobody knew what the Nazis were really going to do. So we have to have a little um, a little bit of, um, I don't know, humility when we deal with how the Jews responded to the Nazis. Um, they They didn't, you know, they knew the Nazis hated Jews and they knew the Nazis would do terrible things, but they didn't know exactly what the Nazis were going to do. Nobody knew, not even the Nazis. So um, what lessons do we have? I think the, the only lessons I can think of, and I'm not, you know, I'm not a policy person. I'm a historian. Um, I know the past. I, as for the present and the future, I'm just as good as anybody who's in this lecture. Um, but I think it means that we have to be alert you know, to what's going on um, always and uh, and try to understand things. But that's the best we can do. I must say that the first time I went to Vienna in 1976, when I was working on my dissertation, I was a Jewish girl from Brooklyn. I had gone to school in New York. I had lived in New York all my life up to that point. I didn't know what anti-Semitism was. I knew it existed. I, I knew my father was a survivor of Auschwitz, for God's sakes. Of course, I knew it existed, but I um, had never experienced it personally. And I experienced it personally in, in Vienna um, in 1976. Nothing terrible happened to me, but people said nasty things. And um, and I, um, I understood I understood the Jews of Vienna better because of that. And the reason I understood them better because of it was because one of the ways I coped as a human being, a real human being, was to ignore it. One of the ways I coped, I, a New York Jew, a, a person, a post-Holocaust Jew, whose father was a survivor of ashes, I just, it was easier to ignore it than to, if you have to live with it all the time, it's hard to cope. You, how do you live your life, right? So I, I ignored it. I mean, not that I um, liked it and I talked about it ever, you know, lots to other people, but I, you know, so that's all I want to say right now. I, I, you know, I think we just have to be vigilant and that's the best we can do. 
Thank you. And um, as a follow up, there, there's a several questions about um, how, how what was how was anti you, you mentioned anti Semitism when you were there. How was it experienced sort of in the in the daily lives um, in the, in the early 20th century in Vienna? Do you have anything more to add to that? Yeah, I could add. And, you know, I mean, I think it it also it varies a little bit. You know, it was worse in the 30s than it had been in the 1890s or, or something. But um, if, if you read the memoirs of Jews from Vienna, they all they all mention anti-Semitism. You know, they 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 talk about it. They talk about the slights they experienced as Jews. They talked and they knew that certain careers were not open to them as Jews, right? Of the judiciary, the professoriate. It was almost impossible for a Jew to get a professorship at the university. I mean, Sigmund Freud was not a professor at the university, for example, um, and others. Um, uh, so it was, you know, certain things were closed to, to Jews, careers, certain careers. Um, but in, for the most part, Jews could ignore it. Um, because there were no laws against the Jews. They didn't actually suffer. You know, there was no, um, uh, there wasn't violence. I mean, there was in 1938, but before that, you know, there wasn't. Well, there was a little bit at the end of World War I when the, when the monarchy collapsed. But, but, you know, that's a period of extreme crisis. Um, so I think in their day-to-day -day lives, they knew about it, they saw it, they uh, worried about it, they formed defense organizations. You think the ADL is the first organization against anti-Semitism? It was the last. Um, the first was the, the Austrian-Israelite Union in Austria. It was 1886. The ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, was 1906, right? Um, and this, this organization took anti-Semites to court and it, you know, propagandized against, you know, so the Jews were, you know, they organized themselves and Zionism is a response to anti-Semitism and, and increasingly Jews were Zionists. So there was um, a, a great deal of awareness of anti-Semitism and, 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 and Jews and election, periods of election, uh, you know, election uh, campaigns were periods in which the anti-Semitic political parties invade against the Jews and Jews um, invade against the anti-Semites, you know, and, and so forth. Um, so they 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 coped with it. The Afrusis were odd if they it pretended that anti-Semitism didn't exist because other Jews knew it existed, right? The Rothschilds, for example, so another banking family. Thank you. Yeah, and so we can. Um, there's there's an, as the questions come in, there's an amazing number of of people who whose family or, or um, is from is from that part of the world in Vienna itself. Um, so there's a number of questions um, asking more specifics about that, um, but to, uh, to to move on to a different subject for the moment, I, uh, one here, I have heard that there were many Jews involved in real estate development, including building most or many of the Ringstrasse buildings. Is that correct? Probably were, yeah. I mean, Jews were active in real estate development. Um, not as much as in New York. In New York, they were really big in real estate development, but they were there too. Um, uh, I, I don't know too much about that specifically, but they were. Um, they were there. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't have any details that I could give about yeah. that. Okay. But they. They certainly were involved in that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there's at least three questions here um, on on the play Leopoldstadt. And whether or not your your research has has um, if you have anything to say about that based on on your research, its accuracy or any other commentary about it. I saw the play. Um, I was in New York last January, and I made sure to go and see it. I think as a piece of drama, as a piece as a piece of theater, it is unbelievably gripping and moving. And I was I was totally entranced by it as a play until the end. And I really did not like its ending because the implication was that all Jews or virtually all Jews completely misunderstood and stayed and ended up in Auschwitz and dead. But the fact is two thirds of the Jews of Vienna left. That is a fact. And, um, uh, and the other third didn't leave largely because they couldn't get visas. They were you know, they, they waited too long or they, whatever, they couldn't get visa. It was hard. Immigrating was hard. It's not like I want to leave, I'm leaving. You know, they couldn't leave unless they got a visa. And 
but they managed to get visas um, and they went all sorts of places, you know, just to get to safety um, uh, and, and so forth. And, and the implication of the play is that Jews didn't do that. They were blind. And I didn't like that part of it. I really, it really ruined the play for me because it was a play that I, and there were little things that they got wrong, but who cares? You know, obviously um, theater sometimes gets things wrong, but um, I don't know why Stopper did that. He may have been talking about Prague, which is where his family was in fact from. They were not from Vienna. He set the play in Vienna, but in fact, his family was from Prague. And Prague Jews had a much harder time leaving. Even if they wanted to, they couldn't. It was some managed, but they, you know, to the United States, there was a national origins quota, and the German quota was fairly large. It was thirty thousand a year, which wasn't enough, but it was still not three. You know, it was not tiny, and Austria was part of Germany after March of thirty-eight, so they were part of the larger pool of Germans. And um, but the Czech quota, I don't know what it was, but it was tiny. And um, so it was very hard to get out of Czechoslovakia. Some managed. They went to, um, you know, Great Britain or to Palestine, then Palestine. Um, they, you know, some did leave, uh, but not. But anyway, so that's what I have to say about Leopoldstadt. Um, that's what I have to say about Leopoldstadt. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and there's actually one of the um, questions somebody asked. In which you are you already um you already answered so you can tell me if you have more to say about it but could you say something about the difficulty of obtaining visas to the U.S. Um, this person's family um, was able to leave Vienna in 1938 with great difficulty. Um, right. Yeah, it was hard to get a visa to go any place. You know, the um, people waited on hugely long lines, it, and you know, it was just very hard. Um, to get a visa, and there were, you know, you were given a number, and and um, um, and you could wait for your visa in another country, and so that's why a lot of Jews got caught, you know, in France, Belgium, and Holland because that's where they went. Um, 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 the um, uh, to wait for their visas because they were worried that it was dangerous in Austria or in Germany. Um, and some of them got out, but some of them did not. Um, the uh, it, it was just very hard to get a visa. The American government was, first of all, the numbers of visas they could give was relatively small. There were, after all, about 500,000 Jews in Germany and 200,000 Jews in Austria trying to leave. Um, at 700,000 people, and most of them wanted to leave. Not all of them. There were people who didn't want to leave, uh, but but mostly they wanted to leave. And and there was 30,000 a year. And then in 19... The United States actually granted 30... Well, it's not 30,000, it's 27,000. But the, the United States actually granted in 1938 and 39, they did grant those, that, those numbers. But starting um, in the middle of, of 1940... They started to still grant that number, but only if you were already out of Germany. And, and it was almost impossible if you were still in Germany and Austria was in Germany to get a visa. Um, and um, and then in the middle, at, at a certain point, I, I get the exact timing confused, but um, they, they, they really cut down on the number of visas. That, that is the, the, the uh, visa section of the State Department was it really didn't want refugees in America. And they started to cut down on the, on the numbers that they would grant. Um, and so from the middle of 1941, it was almost impossible. Remember, until the United States entered World War II at the end of 1941, it was a neutral country. You could theoretically go there, right? Um, it's not like if you didn't get out by September 1st, 1939, you couldn't go there. You could, you could, and you did. But um, but the State Department made it very difficult uh, starting in 41. But even before 41, it was still very hard because there weren't enough. And Jews, they lined up at other embassies too. It wasn't just the United States. They they went to Great Britain, but great, you couldn't go to Great Britain after September 3rd, 1939, because Great Britain was at war with Germany. So you couldn't do it. Um, and and Great Britain wasn't so nice in Palestine, right? Because they restricted very very much and 
May 1939, they restricted the numbers of Jews they would admit to Palestine. Um, and um, But you could go to Shanghai if you had the money for a ticket to Shanghai, you know, a, a boat ticket, you went, you left from southern France or Italy or someplace, and you went, you know, through the Mediterranean, through the Suez Canal, around, you know, uh, around Arabia and into the Indian Ocean, and you went to Shanghai and up the Pacific. It took several months. It was an expensive ticket. But Jews did that, too. And they went to South America. They went all sorts of places, um, but it was hard to get any place. But the Jews of Germany and Austria were much luckier than any other Jews in Europe because many of them did get to safety. And that was not available for the Jews in Poland or the Jews in um, Hungary or the Jews in um, Slovakia or other places in Europe. Thank you. Yeah, I can. I can believe that, given the, the number of stories that are that are coming in in, in the chat. And another uh, another question from somebody whose whose family um, was was in, in Vienna at that time said uh, is asking when the empire collapsed, uh, chaos ensued. How was Jew How was the Jewish community affected? Uh, my grandfather had been an official in the finance ministry and lost his job. Right, um, finance ministry of where. They'll have to type type it in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Time. Okay, I'm not uh, sure because it depends where you were. Uh, you know, um, the 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 if he was in um, in Czechoslovakia, he might have lost his job because he was German, um, and uh, and so forth. In Vienna, you know, I don't know. I mean, remember the, the monarchy collapsed, so it doesn't need the finance ministry changes. It's now the Austria became a tiny little country, um, no, no longer a big a big multinational empire. So. Um, uh, but there was chaos and it was very difficult. Um, the, the order was established pretty quickly. The chaos didn't last as long as it did in Poland. In Poland, the chaos lasted for several years um, because of fighting um, um, and, and so forth. It was the chaos. I mean, order wasn't restored in Poland until about 1921. But in, but in Austria, it was restored fairly quickly. But the situation was not good. Austria, you know, suffered economically. Interwar Austria suffered economically. It suffered politically. Um, it was cut off from its markets. Uh, it, it, you know, it, the interwar period was a really terrible time. Um, and there was a lot of um, economic there were many economic problems. There were many political problems. Um, the Austria wanted in 1918, 1919, Austria wanted Anschluss with Germany. That is, it wanted to be part of Germany. This wasn't Nazi Germany, of course. This was Weimar Germany. Um, the socialists wanted that too. The Jews didn't want it, but everybody else wanted it. And they wanted it because they thought, well, the principle of national self-determination, which is dominating Europe now, means that Austria... German, they should be part of Germany. But the allies, the Americans, the British and the French wouldn't allow it. And so Austria had to continue to exist. And um, there were a lot of people very unhappy with that. They wanted to be part of Germany. So yeah, there was a lot of chaos. Um, and there was a little period of violence against the Jews. The Zionists formed a self-defense unit to guard the Leopoldstadt, but nothing really bad happened. Um, and, and order was restored. And um, and the 1920s were, you know, an okay time, you know, there were the movies, Jews were active in the movie business, lots of, you know, Hollywood moved from Vienna to, I mean, ha, I'm sorry, Vienna movie makers and Berlin movie makers moved to Hollywood in the 1930s. So, um, you know, uh, Vienna and Berlin were major centers of movie production and, um, and so forth. So, um, so the 20s weren't so bad, the 30s were much worse. Thank you. Yeah, and there's there's a there's several questions about where where Jews um, went when they got visas, and I know you've you've mentioned this a couple of times. There, there's another uh, another example here if you, if you have more to say about it. But this uh, this person's family went to Italy um, because Mussolini was not yet imposing any of the anti-Semitic laws, and it was fairly easy to get to Italy. However. Um, my, his two great uncles went to Italy, ended up being deported from there to Theresienstadt. So I don't know if you have, if you want to say anything more about where, where Jews ended up in, in that person's story. Yeah, thanks. Um, and some Jews did go, I mean, Jews went every place. <laughs> um, but um, the, uh, some Jews went to Poland, you know, they went any place, they just left. Um, 
the um not that many went to Italy that you know some Jews did go but many did not go and the the Italy started to impose anti-Jewish laws already in 1938 and later in 38 but in 38 but not I mean those were mostly just discriminatory not not terrible um it was bad to be a foreign Jew any place in Europe um there they were the first to be deported in France for example of all the Jews in France only 25 percent were in fact deported but virtually all of those who were deported were foreign Jews, not French Jews, not, not long-term French Jews. Um, and um, and that's because, not because of the Germans, it's because of the Vichy policies and so forth. Vichy really hated foreign Jews and it incarcerated them in Vichy concentration camps. And then they were easy to deport to Auschwitz in 1942. Um, uh, I mean, some of them got visas and left. I mean, uh, Hannah Arendt was in one such camp and she got a visa to America and came to America. Um, but um, it was uh, it was really difficult uh, for Jews in some places. And, and it depended on where they went, how, how well they fit in. There were many, some Jews did go to one or another Latin American country. But they regarded that as temporary. That would just be a place they would stay until they could come to America. So, in fact, one memoir of living in Bolivia, of going from Vienna to Bolivia, um, um, uh, one um, a memoir is called Hotel Bolivia, uh, right? Because they regarded Bolivia as a hotel. And they came, his family, he was only a 10-year-old boy, his family came to America after the war. You could there was the German quota was still in effect. It was twenty seven thousand, and they got that visa to America. And that, you know, so going to Ecuador, going to Bolivia was a good idea, right? And um, so it it was just difficult. I would like to say one thing um, uh, about uh, uh, and it has to do with Joshua Haberman. He was you know, a student in the rabbinical, sem in, you know, the Jewish, uh, in the rabbinical seminary in Vienna, and he ended up at Hebrew Union College. Hebrew Union College was very good about trying to rescue uh, German and Austrian Jews in the 1930s and bring them to America as students. And, and those were special visas uh, for students. Uh, JTS was okay, but HUC was better um, at it. Um, I mean, JTS was okay. It, it too brought students over, but not as many. Um, HUC was really, really good at bringing um, rabbinical students to the United States. Um, and, and, you know, so I, I just wanted to add that. Uh, as a, and, and so I don't know if Haberman's family also managed to leave. I think they did. I think his, his parents managed to get out. I, I, but I don't remember, maybe somebody in the audience knew Rabbi Haberman better than I and could say. Um, yeah, um, I never had the, unfortunately, I never had the opportunity to to meet Rabbi Haberman and- uh, He was a lovely I man. <laughs> met some of his his children, but you know, one of, one of, one of them, uh, Debbie Perlmeter is on our board. So oh, right, we still have a nice connection there. Um, um, also, on that note, do you, is there anything more you want you want to say about the the Vien, Viennese rabbinical seminaries? And um... oh no, that's not. Um, I you know there they were there was one uh, you know the, and it was uh, you know it was traditional and modern and both at the same time and uh, you know it, it was a nice place and and uh, you know it gave gave boys a good Jewish education for the rabbinate. Um, most Jews from Austria who went to rabbinical school went to Breslau, the, the Jewish Theological Seminary in Breslau, for the most part, uh, which was a bigger school and, and, and so forth. Or they went to Budapest. Budapest had a very important rabbinical school, and it functioned both in German and Hungarian. So uh, Jews went there. You know, I do want to say one thing, in, um, uh, and that's about uh, reparations that Austria gave, because it's about... It's a, it, it deals a little bit with the anti-Semitism of post-war Austria. Um, Austria, at the end of World War II, um, refused to accept any responsibility for the Holocaust. Um, it saw itself as the first victim of Nazism. Um, and you, Matt, when you introduced this lecture, you talked about the German Nazi, you know, the German Nazi takeover. That's not exactly what happened. The Austrian Nazis and the German and the German Nazis uh, 
collaborated on the Nazi takeover of Austria and the Anschluss with Germany. Um, and um, and I'm not talking about Hitler. He he will we'll count him as a German Nazi at that point, not a not an Austrian one. But um, at the Allies, America and England and so forth, they they um, encouraged Austria to feel this way as the first victim of Nazism. It was part of wartime propaganda that that Austria was the first victim of Nazism, and and so Austria could ignore the fact that. Um, a million people went into the streets in March of 38 to uh, to cheer Hitler when he arrived, and that Austrian Nazis were very important in the Holocaust. Um, I'm not talking about Hitler. I'm talking about others. Adolf Eichmann was an Austrian, and um, and Ernst Kaltenbrunner, who headed the Reichmann Office for Security after the assassination of Heydrich, was an Austrian, and Odilo Globocznik, who engineered the Holocaust in Poland, was an Austrian and others who are even less famous than they. Um, so Austrians were very important in the Holocaust and um, there was a great deal of anti-Semitism in the streets of Vienna and more so than in Germany and so forth, but they were the first victims of Nazism. And what that means is that after the war, they, unlike West Germany, which did give reparations to Jewish survivors and to the state of Israel, um, Austria didn't, they were not, responsible. They were the first victims of Nazism. That has changed since the 1980s. Is Austria has now um, um, started to give some reparations uh, to Jewish survivors um, and um, who are Austrian and so forth. And things are better. I've never experienced the same degree of anti-Semitic um, snide remarks since 1976. And I've been to Austria a lot. And it's it's just really not there anymore. So um, it, but it was there. Um, um, but um, Austria was especially bad about not just um, about reparations, but also about re restoring property, like Jews who did return and wanted their apartments back, or wanted their businesses back or wanted their this back or that back, almost couldn't do it. I mean, almost never succeeded. Um, uh, in doing it, it was it was very difficult, and even today, it's probably still very hard. And I'm I'm sure many people are familiar with the attempt by I forgot her name Altman was her last name I think who tried to get her aunt's the painting of her aunt Adela Bloch Bauer back from you know the Austrian museums which had it after the war the Nazis had taken it but you know, it was in the Austrian museums and she did get it back, but but it was really very, very hard. And the Austrians were very angry that not just that she got it back, but that she then turned around and gave it to, um, uh, uh, what's his name, Lauder, Ronald Lauder's museum in New York. Um, they were really mad at that. So, you know, they're not, they're not totally comfortable with their Nazi past in this, in, Germans, not right away, but in the course of the later 20th century, did come to grips with their responsibility for the Holocaust, and and Austrians much less so. Some did, of course, but not all. No. Thank you. Um, as a follow up, how how many Austrian Jews returned to to Vienna after World War II? Not that many. Um, there's a new book by, about it by a woman who works at the Holocaust Museum named Elizabeth Anthony, and it's a wonderful book. Um, and um, so there were Jews who returned. Um, and uh, I don't remember the total number, a few thousand, but not very many. Um, and um, the, those who returned were mostly either it, leftists, communists, and socialists who wanted to rebuild a new Austria that would not be like, you know, Nazi Austria, um, um, or they were intellectuals and other types who just couldn't function outside of the German language. Um, and and a, a lot of them were people who had been in hiding during the war in Vienna and then just came out and stayed. They didn't return. They were there. Um, but not a lot, not a lot. Because they had made new lives already in America or in Great Britain or in the British mandate for Palestine, which after 1948 was Israel, of course. And um, and their children were Americans and British and Israeli, and they didn't want to leave. They were also very angry. I mean, there was an enormous 
enormous, enormous anger at home in anti-Semitic Vienna. They're still Viennese, but they are very angry. I mean, Varone talks in his memoir about about his anger towards Austria and um, and how hard it was to go back there. And he did. He didn't go back to live, but he he went back. On the other hand, many Austrians, Austrian Jews, Viennese Jews, Viennese Jews and Austrian Jews were the same in the interwar period because virtually all the Jews in interwar Austria lived in Vienna. Um, the um, they had an affection for Austria, even though they hated it. And they often vacationed in Austria because their idea of what you do in the summer is to go to the mountains in Austria. And they couldn't imagine not doing that. And so they did it. Um, they just did it. So it's, you know, it's hard to be displaced. It's really hard to be displaced. And um and when you are, even though you make a home, a new home for yourself in America or in Israel or in Great Britain, um, the Jews who went to Shanghai, by, of course, left too. <laughs> um, the, um, even if you make a new home for yourself and you learn the language and you're professionally successful and you like your new country and you feel American or British or Israeli, yeah, it's, you're still a displaced person. And that is really hard. But it's just hard. So. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and um, just uh, following up on, on the Haberman family, I, I neglected to, to mention, to say that his sister um, is 99 years old. Rabbi Haberman's sister is oh, lovely. still alive. So, um, and I've, I've met some of some of her, her children also. Um, um, oh, yeah, no. that, but so I, I assume his parents. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, his parents were. Yeah, somebody noted in, in the yeah, his parents were able to also um, come over. Right, right. Yeah, so, you know, as you noted, uh, that you know it's difficult to leave and 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 you know and come back. Really, there's there's a few questions where people asked if you have thoughts about the program. I guess there's a program that somebody noted in 2019 that allows. Jews um, to return. Um, if you if you have any thoughts on that, or if you know um, anything about it, um, yeah, I do. I mean, that is um, Jews who um, like grandchildren of the people who left yeah. can reclaim Austrian citizenship. Of course, Germany has allowed that for a longer time. Austria it took Austria till whatever year twenty nineteen or whenever it was, um, and and Germany did it earlier, much earlier. I don't know. I don't remember the year. Um, you know, the fact is the only people, most of the people, not the only, but most of the people who do that just want to get EU citizenship. And it's just a way to get, you know, to get EU status. Um, uh, I don't know that they're doing it because they're embracing Austria. You know, they're doing it uh, because they want to have the benefits of being um, uh, EU people. Um you know, Pol you can do it in Poland too. Poland allows, uh, you know, the people to reclaim Polish citizenship. Um, it's harder, I think, in Poland. I have no interest. You know, my father was Polish. He never went back after the war either. He was liberated in Dacha by the Americans and he hung out in Germany until he could go to America. And then he came to America and he never went back because everybody was dead. And um, he, uh, and why should I become Polish? Um, you know, I have no interest. I'm an American. <laughs> you know, I, um, so, uh, so you can do it. Yeah. I mean, Jews can do it, but it's apparently a little hard. It's harder than in Germany. I don't, I don't know what the rules are. People in the audience might know more than I, if their families are from, are from Austria. So. Yeah. Thank you. I, yeah, I totally understand that, you know, how you feel and I'm sure how most of us feel about, you know, returning, returning to Europe or um, wherever our families, you know, came from. You know, I don't know how Josh Haberman felt about going back to Austria. I mean, he certainly didn't want to return, but um, and he he really felt American and he was he was um, very well and and meshed in the American Jewish scene. Uh, but he must have gone to Vienna and Austria, after, you know, in the, at some point more than once. And 
Um, you know, I don't know what that was like for him. Um, it's, uh, you know, if, if you know, it, it, he was probably like many of the of people who wrote memoirs about their experience. On the one hand, it felt incredibly comfortable. And on the other hand, it felt incred incredibly alien. And they wondered who was a Nazi and what they had been doing during the war and how many Jews they'd killed. You know, it was just a complicated, a complicated experience to go to to return. But it was the city of their youth. And you know, the city of your youth is a special place for you, unless you hated it, you know, but um, it's a special place, you know, the, where you did certain things and ate certain candies or, um... <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yes. Yeah, there's actually a number of people who have written in the comments that they have reclaimed their um, Austrian citizenship and that the process wasn't um, wasn't too difficult. Oh, that's good. Um, yeah, some of them mentioned that they just, you know, like you said, they they wanted, uh, you know, a lot of people want EU, um, but somebody also noted that you know some some young some people with young families were actually moving back to. So, well, you know, they say Vienna is the nicest city in the world to live in, right? That's the new thing about Vienna, and that it's the nicest city in the world, and it is a lovely city. I mean, it's a it's a it's a it's a city you can get around easily. It has good social services. It has excellent medical care. It has great culture. It's um, beautiful. It's maybe it's not the most beautiful city, but it is certainly a beautiful city. It's clean. <laughs> it's a, it's a very nice city, and um, uh, it's um, but. It, and it's less anti-Semitic than it was. There's no question, and much less anti-Semitic than it was. Um, it, you know, things have changed. People change. Uh, the old people are dead. You know, um, but um, but you know, it's it's that's a personal choice whether you want to go to another country or or uh, not. Um, I have a friend who's Viennese and Jewish, and he urged me to when I retire to come to Vienna. And he says, you know the language. It shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> and I said, forget it. I'm not going back to Vienna. I'm not going to Vienna. Although I love to go there. You know, I, I do. I love going to the opera. I love going to um, um, wherever, the museums and so on. Yes, definitely. I haven't had an opportunity to go, but I would I would love to one day. It's It's a lovely city. It's a, you know, it's a charming, lovely city. Um, Budapest is more exciting, I think. That's just personal taste. Budapest reminds me of New York, and not the way it looks. It doesn't look anything like New York, but it it has a kind of nervous energy. Everybody's like this, and it that feels like New York to me. So, um, and Vienna's not like that, but uh, but it's a nice city. Yeah, that's great. There's a, there's many more comments and questions that we're we're not going to get to. I don't know if you're open to. Um, I, I, we could definitely send them to you if you're interested or if you're open to, to receiving email from anyone. Um, I'm open to receiving email, of course. Okay, no great. So we can, so if, uh, unfortunately, for those of you who have sent in comments or questions that we didn't get to, we, we can we can give you uh, Dr. Rosenblitz's uh, email. Right. Uh, just as a, we, you know, as we come to an end here, there, there's a few questions about um, and you, you can you can sort of answer answer either, you know, a couple different ideas, but what what is what is uh, being taught to the younger generations um, in Austria, and sort of like how how is it being memorialized today? I know I know a lot in Germany has been has been well, done. Has been done I personally, don't know about um, Austria as much, um, or any other thoughts you want to leave us with this evening. Okay, well, just to answer the question first, yeah. um, there are some things that are similar to Germany. There certainly is Stolpersteine, you know, the the steps in the in the sidewalk that uh, indicate where Jews were. And there's, um, um, you know, I don't I don't think there's as big a Holocaust memorial in Vienna as there is in, in Berlin. And, um, but there's, you know, there's some, I, I don't know what they teach in the schools. I, I, I My assumption is that they do more in Germany um, because there is still residual sense of being the first victim of Nazism, even if they have officially, 
you know, admitted that they, you know, were not the first victim of Nazism, that that there were Austrian Nazis, that they colluded. Um, they, they admit that now. Um, and it, I assume it's taught in school. I, I don't really know um, the extent to which it is. And um, I... Um, my, my sense is that they that some th that in many circles they're doing the right things in Austria now, but not at as large a scale as in Germany. And Germany has really taken on the sense of responsibility for their past actions in ways that not all Austrians have. Um, but final thoughts. I like studying uh, Vienna. I like I like working on these issues of. Um, uh, Central European Jews and their and how they coped with um, a very complicated landscape, you know, a much more complicated landscape that is, on the one hand, a society that wanted them to integrate, and on the other hand, a society that resented them for trying to integrate. There's anti-Semitism everywhere, but it was more extensive and more deep-rooted there than it is here, thank God. Um, and um, uh, and it was hard for the Jews, you know, but they coped pretty well, <laughs> and they um, participated in the society in which they lived, um, and they loved it, and they fought for it. Um, I know that there's, you know, certain certain tragedy there's a great tragedy, not a certain tragedy, but a great tragedy, because of course, um, the Nazis came to power and killed the Jews of Europe, um, all of them, whether they were religious or not religious. And there were Jews in, um, in Austria, for example, that reported for deportation. Most of the people, by the way, who could get visas were under 50. Most of the people who remained were not stupid, they were old. And you couldn't get a visa if you were over 50. You just couldn't. I mean, sometimes, you know, occasionally, but usually not. So most of the people who were left were old. They were old. They weren't old, but they were over 50. And um, and that means that a lot of Jews who left had to leave grandma behind, right? Grandma was left. But anyway, um, now where was I going though? That was a little aside. Uh, I'm tired, I think. Um, the um, now I don't. I really truly don't remember. So I will just leave you with the fact that they. Oh, I know what I was going to say. So the 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 elderly people when they had a report for deportation in 1942, the Jews were primary from Germany and Austria were primarily deported in 42, some of them to Theresienstadt and then Auschwitz, some of them directly to the camps, the death camps. But um, uh, some of them went with their medals from World War One. I. I don't know why, maybe just to embarrass the Nazis. Although the Nazis were, the problem with the Nazis was that they weren't, they weren't, you couldn't embarrass them, right? But I don't want to leave you on that tragic note. <laughs> I want to say that before the Holocaust, the Jews did um, uh, feel that they participate, despite the anti-Semitism, that they participated in the society in which they lived and they were at home in it. And the Holocaust was not inevitable. It happened because of various factors, but it was not inevitable. And they were not stupid. They they just lived in the society in which they lived and contributed to it as best they could. So with that, I will leave you.